Hi, this is Juan Soto with IT Impact, and this is our presentation on how to optimize access with SQL Server. Well, first, a word from our sponsor. This presentation is brought to you by AccessExperts.net, where we specialize in access with SQL Server. Please visit our site and also visit our blog at AccessExperts.net slash blog, where you'll find more video tutorials like this one, as well as additional tips. Also brought to you by AccessHosting.com, offering the latest SQL Server 2012 hosting in the cloud. Try it free today for 30 days. AccessHosting.com. Welcome back. Um, before we get started, I want to talk about a little bit about myself. My name is Juan Soto. I'm a Access MVP, and the name of the firm is IT Impact. We help clients throughout the U.S. My specialty is optimizing access with SQL Server. This presentation is meant for mostly access consultants who want to take their game and up it one more level by using SQL Server with their deployments, or for IT departments who are having issues with uh, upsizing their access databases. Because it's not just upsizing the database and you're done. You may, you may find out that once you upsize, it actually can be slower. The access project can be slower instead of being faster, which is what the, it should be. When you upside a SQL Server. Now, all the uh, links in this presentation are found in one URL, which is this bit that we URL that I'm highlighting here. So, uh, if you wish, pause the presentation, jot down this link, and then um, come back and we'll get started again. This is the same presentation I've given at SQL Server.com events I've gone through around the US. If you're not familiar with SQLSaturday.com, it's a great way to learn about SQL Server on a Saturday. They're free events, lots of sessions. Some of them charge $10 for lunch. And uh, you can go to SQLSaturday.com and look at your region and be able to register for the event close to you. First thing I want to say is I'm not a SQL Server DBA or a SQL Server expert. And the only thing I know about clusters is peanut clusters, which are my favorite candy. What I am is a developer for Microsoft Access, a consultant for businesses nationwide, and an expert in optimizing access with SQL Server and the interaction between the two, reducing bottlenecks, improving performance, and using techniques to accelerate the application as much as possible. I love Access. It's a, just a wonderful platform to create solutions. Flexible, easy to use, easy to program. Just a great product that allows me to build business solutions in a shorter time frame than it would if I used web technologies or .NET. Now there's this dark side to Microsoft Access in the IT world. A lot of IT departments despise the database. And there are reasons for that. Mostly people get to access with Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. So there's an implicit authorization from IT. I got these programs, I'm gonna use them, including access. Now, another issue is a lot of these department managers turn to IT for help with their mission critical access databases. But IT is too busy with enterprise projects. And so they get turned away. And desperate, they turn to access. So you have a scenario where a manager says, hey, Joe, you know Access. Go ahead and build us this database. Joe burns the midnight candle on both ends and comes up with a solution with no prior database training. And it works. Works well for the company. But it ends up being mission critical and falls back into IT's lap. And when they get it, they're like, oh, my goodness, what a mess. We're supposed to take this and support it from now on? Access is terrible. Well, it's not so much access terrible, but you know, the guy who built it, what do you expect? He doesn't have any database training. The issue is further compounded with JET database technology. It really is an underperformer. Microsoft Access JET is uh, prone to crashes, uh, prone to issues. How many times have you gotten a dollar box that says, you and another user have changed this record you can either copy to the clipboard or discard your changes neither option 
will work for you. And you're asking, so who's the other user? I'm the only one using this database, right? So uh, Jet has tremendous issues, and we don't use it unless we absolutely have to, unless it's a one or two person database. Otherwise, we just go straight, straight to SQL Server. I love SQL Server Express. I think uh, SQL Server was the best thing that ever happened to Microsoft Access. Just a wonderful addition to the uh, Access front end, allowing you to create some marvelous apps that are robust, be able to um, handle hundreds of users, and do that at record time and under budget compared to other technologies such as the web and .NET. It's truly a winning combination. And so uh, the focus of this presentation is how to get there. I built solutions where the access uh, was uh, using a backend and access on the user's local machine, and I moved them to the cloud, the data to the cloud, and it was faster in the cloud than it was on the user's local hard drive. So uh, you can really optimize the system and in that particular case, I used ADPs and as much store procedures as I could. And we'll be talking a little bit about that in, this, in the future slide here. Just look at all the things you can do with SQL Server. These are um, one of my top 10 features. And I would have died to have some of this stuff in Access, such as batch transactions, table triggers, identity insert, things that I just don't have. Uh, in access. So bringing all these to the access developer has been a real boon for me and I hope it has uh, become also for you as well. Now I uh, have a compilation of links here that will help you make the transition over to SQL Server uh, and specifically T-SQL. Uh, Transaction SQL is the uh, VBA of SQL Server you will and learning it was really easy for me. Uh, it was uh, it's powerful it's got great intelligence capabilities, and I found these articles on the web, uh, which are listed in that Bitly uh, bundle I taught you at the beginning of the presentation. And if you go there, you'll see all these links, and by all means, please take a look at them. Um, one of my favorites is the uh, short SQL Server tutorials, where I've been able to quickly find answers to questions on T-SQL. So basically what I'm saying here is in order to really maximize the relationship between Access and SQL Server, you have to become a little bit of a SQL Server developer and learn the T-SQL language and learn how to create store procedures, functions, and views. Otherwise, you're really not going to take advantage of what the two uh, uh, have to offer together, Access with SQL Server. So what I'm saying also here is that you should use Access for the presentation layer. All the code reporting uh, should be in Access. All the forms should be in Access. And then use SQL Server for the data storage, security, and query. Use SQL Server what it's uh, best for, which is to analyze and process millions of records in record time. Now, you may also want to use local tables to minimize traffic. For example, a list of states you know, we're not going to add any states to the USA anytime soon. So I think it's safe to say you can use a local table in Access for the list of states. Now, what I also do is I probably have the same table in SQL Server because I may need that in a query situation. So sometimes these local tables get replicated in SQL Server, and that's okay. They're usually static and not that many records. You also want to minimize connections, uh, and we're going to be talking about that in a bit. Now you got to start somewhere, and most likely that's importing data to SQL Server. And the absolute best way of doing that is with the Microsoft SQL Server Migration Assistant. Make sure you grab the right assistant for the version that you're trying to do. So uh, 2008 for 2008, 2010, 2012 for SQL Server 2012. Review the suggested conversions. Make sure it makes sense to you. For example, we always use Varchar for our text fields. So if I only need a 10 character field, for text, I'll put in bar char 10. Sometimes the migration system will do n bar char, and that's not needed unless you're doing international apps. You also want to follow the conventions for bit fields. Make sure that they're set to there's a zero in there for default. Otherwise, you're going to run into problems with your data and access. And every table, I advocate this 
Every table should have a timestamp field. Oh, and 2012 is called a row version. Now, what that does is it allows SQL to tell Access when the record was last updated. We never use it for anything. We don't use it for queries, reports. We don't display it to the user. So we leave that off, uh, that field out, the timestamp field. Just call it anything you like. We usually call it TS for timestamp. And sometimes you need to create additional indexes for your foreign keys. And this is particularly true with uh, a new table, right? So after you've migrated over to SQL Server, then you need to create your first table in SQL Server. And access, when you have an ID as a foreign key, for example, customer ID in the order table, access will automatically add that index. Not so with SQL Server. You need to take care of that yourself personally. So learn how to add indexes to your tables. Now, some gotchas you're going to have when you migrate to existing databases is hybrid queries. If you have a query that's using a local access table with a SQL Server table, uh, that won't work well. You need to either uh, download that SQL table as a temporary table or figure out a way to do it all on SQL Server and just return that as a pass-through query. Uh, trust me when I say this, that the hybrid queries will um, really uh, slow down your app. Also, if you reference a custom function in Access, that's not going to get migrated to a SQL Server. You need to then uh, rethink your strategy. Maybe you just need to uh, do a better query there in SQL. Maybe you need to create a function in SQL Server to replace that, or maybe you need to scrap the whole thing and use a store procedure to return that data back to SQL, to a big data to Access, excuse me. Um, you know, and views, views are great. We use views all the time. Uh, we'd rather that SQL Server do the joins and then we just take the product that join and bring it down to access for either reports or forms. But if you ever have a need to use a view as a data entry method in access where you need to edit, delete, or update data, you're going to need to create an index on that view. Now you can create indexes on SQL Server using the create view syntax in T-SQL or you can execute this statement here which is create index name on view name and access. And you can run that SQL statement in your code and it will create an index on that attached table, local index and access. Now, one of the drawbacks to using editing and views is that if you delete a record using that view, SQL Server may be confused as to which table you deleted from. Because remember, view is may include more than one table. So, for example, if you want to delete an order and you've got the customer table and the order table in that view, there may be some confusion in SQL, or it may not delete the record at all, or it may end up deleting your, both your customer and your order, which I'm pretty sure is not what you want. So you need to add what's called a delete trigger to your view to intercept that delete operation and tell it, okay, I only want you to delete the record and order, not the record for the customer tables. And I think about views and access is that uh, they're concealed tables and regular access. And many times we'll disguise that. We'll have a TBL orders when it really is just a view in SQL. I'm going to talk to you about optimal design. This is what I recommend would be the best design choice for you and your application. Whenever possible, you want to use Windows credentials, the Active Directory. It's great because with Active Directory, your network administrators can place employees in the roles that they need to be in with your app. So I ask my clients, network administrators, to create groups, security groups, and their AD just for the app. So I'll have an admin group, I'll have a power user group, I'll have a read-only group. I like placing managers in read-only. That's where they need to be, so they don't mess with the data. And um, you know, use, uh, use that security model to save yourself headaches. Now, what's going to happen is you need to relate those domain security groups with security roles in SQL Server. So you need to connect those two. Now, in, um, you know, um, we already talked about this, which is storing data in SQL Server, the most, most of your data in SQL Server. 
and you use DS Analyst tables for rapid deployment. DS Analyst is the way to go because let's say for example you have an app that's used by 100 users and yes we do have apps, we design apps for that. You don't want to go to 100 desktops for all of DSN and there are ways you can do it automated through the Active Directory but we don't even bother. We just program our tables with DSN list and I have a blog post that you see there pop up now. And then the last thing we do is we use ADODB and SQLDB to bypass chat to go straight to the SQL Server. Now, as you probably heard, SQLDB is being deprecated, it's no longer being used. So we may alter this and just go to just using link tables and ADODB uh, still for issuing commands to SQL Server. I can't emphasize this last point enough. Say for example you have an update uh, operation that you want to do on a table of records. So say for example you want to increase prices across the board for 10% on your product catalog. Well, if that product catalog is a million records, the last thing you want to do is have access to that for you. You want to have SQL Server instead. So what you do is you create an ADODB command in your app that issues that command to SQL Server. Uh, update TPL product items where uh, set price equal price times 1.1%, right? So it just make it 10% more. You never want access doing updates, deletes, or inserts unless you absolutely need to. Always use ADODB and command objects for that. Now, um, I have a, a blog post that talks about easy ADODB, and I encourage you to take a look at that as well. One of the things that we always insist on is we create a unique view for each report. We made a mistake of not following this advice once, and we ended up with a great view that we thought we can use on almost every report in an application. Until, you guessed it, the client asked us to make a change, and we changed this basic view that was referenced everywhere, and it up messing a lot of reports. So effective after that date, we started creating unique views for each report. We already talked about store procedures. Uh, password queries are a wonderful way also to get store procedures uh, data. So um, you, what you do is you create the password query on the fly, and then you assign that record that password query to as a record source to a report. So that's one of my favorite ways of assigning data from a store procedure into a report. You can also do this for a form, but mostly people like to edit data on the form. So uh, we rarely do that. But uh, for a report, it's really nice. I want to wrap up this presentation by talking about SQL Server, the web, or the cloud, and access. Uh, I think there are, SQL Server is wonderful with access, but it's even better when you can use it in the cloud and create apps they can be used worldwide. Many times you have this case when uh, obviously you can't use VPN or VPN is not available. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we were hired by a franchise system to create an app for all their franchisees throughout the US. They didn't want to have the network infrastructure for them to log in via VPN, via VPN uh, because that would create security issues at their headquarters. And so uh, we created this app using SQL Server in the cloud and access ADP. Now access ADP has been deprecated, no longer available in 2013 even. Uh, so if you got a version of 2007, uh, that's what we would go back to, to create an access ADP if we ever needed to go back and use that technology. Even so, um, we believe that uh, it's a winning combination. Now, it's going to require a lot of optimization and tweaking, uh, especially with the uh, use of SQL Server procedures, SQL Server Store procedures, uh, and really watching the uh, data that's being downloaded to the client. And that was a case I quoted earlier where it was actually faster once we converted to SQL Server uh, than using a local access file to store the data was when I was referring to this franchise system. So I want to thank all you guys for um, viewing the video. It took a lot of work. This is a topic that I'm really passionate about. I do it, I presented this many times over the U.S. So I'm happy to bring it to the web and uh, to a worldwide audience. 
Uh, you can uh, subscribe to my blog at accessesport.net slash blog and get my post as soon as they're out of the oven and delivered to your email address. Uh, the other thing is you can also contact me if you uh, need us to uh, help you with your SQL Server project or uh, need to hire us uh, to convert to SQL Server, please consider us for that at accessesport.net. And also, um, I want you to consider accesshosting.com. They have a free 30-day trial on hosting SQL in the cloud, SQL 2012, which is wonderful, and we actually provide their supporting uh, services for them and that venue. So uh, please consider uh, in your next Access in the Cloud project going to accesshosting.com and uh, try out their uh, hosting for the web. Before I leave, I wanted to ask you to leave any comments uh, regarding the video right here and uh, my blog. Love to hear from you guys. Let me know what you thought about it. It's only the second video I make, so uh, be gentle. The other thing is that um, please uh, promote this at your Twitter account, LinkedIn, blogs. Feel free to uh, link to it uh, wherever you feel it's appropriate. Thank you very much, and I will talk to you again soon.